So today I'm going to talk about um, using social media for social good. Uh, and you notice it's called an accidental act, uh, uh, um, activist. Let's make sure I can speak. Activist. Uh, so I'm a blogger and a photographer and a writer and an author. I wrote a book called The Beauty of Different. It looks like this. Um, and, uh, and apparently I'm sort of an activist. Uh, and that I didn't actually plan on being that. So uh, how many of you, just out of curiosity, just to kind of see who's here, how many people here are bloggers? Quite a few, nice. How many people here use social media of some sort or another? Everybody, okay, very good. All right, how many people here are here representing a company? Wow, okay, good. How many people here are representing themselves? The same people. <laughs> awesome, all right, cool. Well, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, how I learned to use social media for social good. And uh, I'm gonna kind of whip through. There's a lot of slides, but they're pretty, I hope. So um, hopefully you'll enjoy them. And, uh, and away we go. You guys are ready, yeah? So uh, first of all, I just wanna say that I didn't start out um, as a creative person at all. Or at least I didn't know I was a creative person until very, very late in life. So I'm awful at these things. So, um, you know, just look at that. It worked. Um, yeah, so I didn't start out this way. I actually um, started out as an engineer. I went to Texas A&M University. Any Aggies? Woo, one. <laughs> Dang, where my Aggies at, right? Um, I went to Texas A&M, graduated in 1988. Um, and, uh, my dad was an engineer. I'm the daughter of a PhD engineer. He was a petroleum engineer. And even though I really wanted to be um, something artistic, and like an architect maybe, um, my family used to constantly tell me, oh, you're not artistic, but you're good at math. So I went to civil engineering school. I became a structural engineer, which I figured was sort of architecture without the art. Um, and uh, did that and got out of school and was promptly incredibly bored. I thought I was going to be doing um, skyscrapers and suspension bridges and really sexy buildings like that. Does that make you sad that I was born? <laughs> she was all choked up. <laughs> um, and instead I was doing pipe racks and um, foundations for vessels in the refineries over in Texas City and that bored me to tears. So I thought, well, um, what should I do? Maybe I should go back to school. But I didn't want to get a graduate degree in engineering because I figured that would just be bigger pipe racks and bigger vessel foundations. So I thought, well, I'll go to law school or I'll go to business school. And uh, every engineer I know ended up going to business school. So I figured just to be different, I'd go to law school. Plus, uh, back then, LA Law was like really cool. And Blair Underwood was on there. And they, they all looked really hot and sexy. And I thought I could be hot and sexy like that. So literally, that is why I went to law. That is a bad, <laughs> bad reason to go to law school. So, so I went to law school. Um, and uh, around the same time, uh, I. Uh, bought my very first camera. Um, that, that is actually my very first camera and the very first lens I bought. It was a 19, let me think, I bought it in 1994. I think it was like a 1980 um, vintage camera. The, the lens was even older than that. Um, and I started shooting and I loved it. And I lo what I loved about it was it was a way for me to be creative and still be technical, right? Because I didn't have to draw because remember I'm not artistic. And um, but it was a way that I could like use a gadget and, and find pretty things. So I go to law school. Um, out of law school, I work for a very large multinational corporation um, that will remain nameless. And uh, I was traveling all over the world. And so I was shooting and traveling and traveling and shooting. And I really kind of developed this real passion for photography. Um, at one point, I was transferred. I moved to London, met my very proper English husband and uh, brought him back, best souvenir, souvenir I ever bought on my travels. Um, uh, we got married and we adopted a little girl, um, or a baby, actually an infant. We adopted our daughter, Alex. Um, it, from infancy, my husband cut the cord, so she came home from the hospital with us. And uh, away we went. So back then, I'm still lawyering, I'm still doing this whole thing, and uh, I decided to start a blog. Um, this was in well, she's seven, so it was right before she was born I started it. So 19, um, 2000 and, what is that, seven years ago, 2004? Let's go with that. Um, and I called it chukulunks, which I'm originally from the Caribbean. I'm from Trinidad, and chukulunks is a word we use to mean sweetheart, like for children. Like, oh, you're just such a chukulunks, right? Um, so I started this blog. And so I'm blogging. I'm, an, I'm a lawyer. I've got this young child. 
And I realized that I really don't want to be a lawyer anymore, that I'm working crazy hours, I'm not seeing my kid. So I, um, after a few starts and stops, I quit my law job. And I thought, well, what am I going to do now? Because I'm, you know, as much as I'd love to believe I am, I am not sign of the June Cleaver type. I'm going to have to do something. So I thought, well, and I'm really kind of abbreviating this to get to the meat of this, this talk, but it turns out that the three things that I love to do is I love to, I love to shoot, camera shoot. Um, I love to write and I love to speak. And so I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I don't know what somebody like that is called, but I'm going to be a shooter, writer, speaker. <laughs> right? And, um, and so I uh, decided the best way for me to be a shooter, writer, speaker was to uh, redesign my website. Um, took a long and so this is sort of how the, it looked. It's, a, it's evolved a little bit, but kind of this was my thing. Um, and so I started this website, and I'm like, hello, I'm available for shooting, writing, and speaking. Um, and things were going great. I was blogging, and people were hiring me for gigs, and things were good. And uh, one of the first places that called me was an organization called momversation.com. Uh, have any of you heard of it? I may, a couple, okay. Um, so momversation.com is sort of uh, like the view online, I guess would be the best thing. That what they did is they had a few uh, relatively popular uh, mom bloggers, moms, who were blogging, and they had them discuss issues of the day through the prism of motherhood was the theory, right? Um, and so uh, they asked me to be on it, and I was like, great. And we basically just filmed ourselves in our living rooms. And it got pretty popular. Um, it made the New York Times. And then um, we were invited on Oprah. And so I was on Oprah, which was kind of cool. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, well, let me rephrase. I was on Oprah from my living room, OK? I mean, so basically, like, she, she, you know how Oprah loves the Skype? So like all of us were. Her guests, like she didn't have any, I think she had one guest on that show, but all of us were on big screens in her thing talking to her. But I made her laugh and that was cool. Um, so anyway, so things are good, right? So I'm blogging, I'm on Monversation, I get on Oprah, I get on the New York Times, life is good. Um, and every week what would happen is the producer would come to certain of us, there were about eight of us, but they, each episode had about three people, three or four people. And he would come to a certain three people and say, here's what we want you to talk about. You can say whatever you want, but here's the topic. And on this particular thing, after, after the Oprah um, thing, he came up to me and he said, hey, Karen, we want you and whoever the other two were, I can't remember, um, to talk about what you're going to do for charity. We're getting to the holidays. And uh, holidays are the time when people give back. And so we want you to talk about what you're going to be doing to give back. And I was like, great, and I had no idea because <laughs> I wasn't planning on doing anything. <laughs> Sad but true, right? So I was like, all right, yeah, I can do that. Um, give back. That would be a good thing to do. And so I started thinking, well, what if I'm going to be talking about it online and I'm going to be talking about it on my blog, like I don't want to just say, oh, I wrote a check, right? Like I, I kind of want to do something that's kind of interesting. So I was... Um, Sitting around thinking, and for some reason I thought about a friend of mine um, who I had talked to a few years earlier. And um, she had called me, it was probably about two or three years before this, and she'd called me and she was having a really rough time of it. She was going through a divorce, it was a, kind of a horrible time, and she just called, she needed somebody to talk to. So I listened and, you know, commiserated like you do. And uh, at the, after the phone call, I went and I had a photograph of a sunflower that I had taken. And I grabbed a print. I just had it, happened to have it. I don't generally print my photographs that often, but I happened to have this print that I had done. And I wrote on the back of it, um, hey, her name's Kelly. I said, hey, Kelly, uh, a friend of mine once told me that she can't look at, su at sunflowers without smiling. So I'm hoping this works for you, right? Lots of love, Karen. No big deal, right? Send it in the mail. Um, two years later, we met, she lives, um, she lives on the other side of the country, and two years later we met at a conference, and she came up to me and she hugged me and she said, I have to tell you, um, since you've sent that, I've moved, and that sunflower follows me. I keep it on my fridge, right? So, it, and it still makes me smile, she said, which was great. And so I was thinking, as I was thinking about what kind of charity, you know, this, what sort of charity I should do, I was thinking, you know, photographs are kind of special, because um, 
Like if somebody sends you an email saying I'm thinking of you, chances are at some point you're probably going to delete the email, right? And if somebody um, sends you a note, if somebody writes you a card or sends you a note and says, hey, thinking of you or hope you're happy or hope, you know, you might keep that, but you're probably going to stick it in a drawer somewhere or stick it in a box somewhere. But photographs you tend to display, right? Photographs you kind of, you prop up, right? You stick it on a bulletin board, you frame it, you, you, you tend to display them. So I think there's some power there. So I'm sitting there thinking and I thought, you know, what I'd like to do is I think I'm going to invite people who read my blog to send photographs to me. Um, and I'm going to collect these photographs for all of the kids at Texas Children's Hospital who can't go home for the holidays. Because you got to figure, holidays, you're sitting there in these antiseptic kind of rooms. It's kind of, let's, if you're in the hospital, it's probably not a really great time of your life right now anyway. And so I'm just going to do that. So originally, at first I was just going to blog about it and say, send me your photographs, I'll, send them, I'll take them to Texas Children's. And then I thought, well, maybe I should warn Texas Children's that I'm doing this. So I, um, so I called them and I was like, hi, I'm a blogger, I'm here in Houston, and I want to do a photo drive. And the woman on the other end was like, oh, you mean like uh, holiday cards? And I'm like, no, just photographs, just for people to. And she was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, just to kind of, so they can have them. And people will write things on them. And she was like, OK. And I said, well, I, are you good with that? And she's like, well, yeah, but we have rules. And so she told me the rules. And some of the rules are you know, things that I wouldn't have thought of, like don't say get well soon, because some of them won't, right? Which you wouldn't necessarily think about that. Um, stay away from holiday stuff, because not everybody's Christian, right? So you know, just don't say happy holidays. Don't say get well soon. Don't put pictures of yourself. Like it was really like it was a lot of stuff. But you can say things like, go get them, tiger, and uh, thinking of you, right? And hang in there. And you can say kind of encouraging stuff, right? So I was like, great, thank God I called. So I write an email, I mean, I write a blog post, and I'm like, I'm doing this, guys. You want to help me do it? Um, and uh, yeah, they helped. So that's my kitchen table. Um, in about 10 days, maybe, I got about 1,000 photographs from all over the world, from at least 10 different countries, of just everything, people's vacations, um, animals, their pets, lots of pets, lots of dogs, lots of cats. Um, sunsets, sunsets were big. Um, and everybody was just like, hang in there, keep, you know. And it was great. So I boxed them all up and I drove over to Texas Children's Hospital and uh, the woman was like, yeah, thanks, right? And she kind of took them. And then a few months later, I got a letter from the hospital. And she said, this was like probably April, like, four, you know, way after the holidays. And she said, I just wanted to thank you. She goes, not only have the kids loved them, but the parents love them. And we pass them out to the parents who are keeping vigil with their children. And it was so nice to think that people had done something for them. And, and we have enough that we're going to be giving them out for the rest of the year, right? Which was great. So right on, right? Now I'm done, right? I'm like, OK, fine. So I go on in my life. Things are good. So that's like April. Then in July. I um, wake up one morning and I reach over a bad habit of mine and I turn on my laptop and I turn on CNN and this guy is on um, CNN. And I don't know if you guys remember this, this was the pastor in um, Florida, Terry Jones, who had decided that um, Islam was of the devil, I'm, tr I'm quoting here, um, and that on September 11th, this was in July, on September 11th he was planning a big burning of the Quran at his church. And I'm saying this, and I'm just, I'm shaking with anger, just saying this was, this is history, and I'm so angry, right? And I was enraged, to say the least, right? And not just because it's so racist and awful, it, it was a church, right? Like, this is a church. And so I remember I got on Twitter, and I was like, have you people seen this? And I put that up there, and I was like, this is incredible. And I thought, I can't, I can't, I have to do something. This is just, this is insane. And so my first, my first inclination, I will tell you, was I'm going to write a blog post, and I'm just going to rail on this. And because this guy, come on. And then my first thought was, well, I, do I want to give him any more press? But I was like, yeah, I'm going to give him press because he's doing you know. <laughs> but then I thought, OK, but you know what? Here's the thing about blogs. And you guys who write blogs, you know about this. You, you tend to have followers. And if you show any kind of strong emotion online, it tends to whip your followers into sort of a sympathetic frenzy, right? 
And I didn't want to rage online and then have everybody grab their torches and pitchforks and get him, you know, kind of thing. And because pretty much that makes me him, right? I mean, that's pretty much me being him. So I thought, all right, well, I can't do that, but I can't do not nothing. So I remembered the photographs that we had sent to Texas Children's Hospital. So I thought, you know what? I went online on Twitter. I said, okay, we're going to bomb this church with peace. We are going to do a photo bomb, and we're going to bomb this church with peace. So I went online, and I was like, okay, guys, remember that photo bomb, that, I mean, that photo drive that we did for, the, for um, Texas Children? We're going to do this again for this guy, right? And what we're going to do is I want you guys to send me images that you have taken that represent peace. And I don't care what they are. It could be the sunset. It could be the ocean. It could be your kid reading. I don't care. Just whatever is peaceful. A candle. I don't care. And I want you to write on the back a message of peace. Right? And it has to be, like, it can't be a passive aggressive, like, I'm really sorry you're an idiot. Like, it has to be, you know, <laughs> like, it has to be a real message of peace. Okay? Um, and if you're in, send them to me, and I will box them up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mail them anonymously to, <laughs> to this church, right? And God bless them, they did it. So I got, and also I said, if you're not a photographer, if you don't want to send a photograph, make a card. I don't care. So you can see there's a little peace symbol that a kid, and people got their kids involved in this. They got um, their yoga studios involved, um, and they all had really great little sayings, love always wins. Peace is not something you wish for, it's something you make, something you do, something you are, and something you give away, right? Lovely quotes. Some people had quotes from the Bible, some people had quotes from the Quran, some people had quotes from, you know, whatever, the Bhagavad Gita, everything, right? Torah, everything. Um, uh, peace is beautiful, just very, very simple. Um, and then I wrote this letter and basically just said to the people of the Dove World Outreach Center, the Dove, the symbol of peace is the name of this church, right? Like, Anyway, I said, we, the people of the rest of the world, wanted to expect, express our vehement disagreement with your planned event to burn the Muslim holy book, the Quran, on September 11th. Each of the cards, photos, and messages contained in this box contain a message of peace to remind you that we are all called to practice love, not hatred. Please consider each item in this box as an individual heartfelt plea to reconsider your actions and instead act as a true leader for peace. So, oh, thank you. Thank you. So I got a box, and then I had my now five-year-old decorate it. And you know, she said things like, "We will love you if you stop and put." <laughs> Bless her, right? And so I packed that up and shipped it off. Um, as it turns out, um, somebody who followed me on Twitter and on my blog uh, was a producer at CNN, and uh, she emailed me and said, "I would really love to do a piece on your photobomb." So I said, well, I would love to be interviewed by you. So um, she did, um, and did this lovely little piece on it. Uh, you can go find it on CNN, but I would recommend you don't look at the comments, because um, people didn't like this. Some people were not happy about it. CNN has some of the meanest comments on ever. Um, anyway, so that went up on September 10th, and September 11th came and went, and he didn't burn the Korans. Coincidence? I would love, a lot of people were emailing like, you did it! And I'm like, I really think probably Homeland Security did it. I don't, <laughs> but that's nice of you to think that maybe that was it. So um, anyway, so that was great. And it was on CNN and things were really, really good. Now the truth is, of course, I have no idea if this guy ever got the box because I didn't put a return address because I figured I could be the next bombing target or a fire target or something. So, um, so I have no idea if he got the box. I have no idea who saw it. And frankly, I didn't expect to change his mind. I'm sure I, I, I'm guarantee you I was not the person that changed the man's mind. Um, but I just thought, you know, maybe somebody in his church might go, yeah, she might have a point. Like, you know, maybe somebody, maybe if it touched somebody, that would be cool, right? Um, but there was always a little part of me that was kind of, oh, I wonder, you know, I wonder what the reaction was, I wonder what happened. Um, I never found out, but um, as it happens, I, uh, I did something else happened that kind of gave me a little hope, right? So. Fine, this is gone. By this point, I've, I'm, I'm well in the writing of my book. I, uh, I am uh, writing my blog. I'm doing my thing. And at one point, I, I put up a life list on my site, 100 things I want to do before I go. Now, this is not um, a bucket list, right? I'm very anti-bucket lists because bucket lists focus on death, and that's a bit morbid, right? This is about injecting awesome into your life, right? This is a list of things that 
will make your day happier and make your life happier, right? Just to do. And it's, I like to call it a life menu, actually. Sort of like, a, you know, if a you think of a menu as a list, but you don't have to eat everything on the menu, right? Like it's just something to pick and choose. So I had done this, and I had published it on my site. And one of the things that I would put on my site was I wanted to build a house for Habitat for Humanity. I wanted to help build, which was a dumb thing to put on the list. Not because I have anything against Habitat. I think Habitat's an awesome organization, but because I can't even paint a wall. I'm like so not handy at all, right? But I thought, you know, I love their organization. I will swallow my pride and try to hammer a nail in for them. And as it happens, um, a former boss of mine is on their board in the local chapter. And so we had lunch just one day. And he said, hey, I saw your life list. And I was like, yeah. He goes, yeah, I saw Habitat was on there. You know I'm on the board. And I was like, oh, right. Is there any way you can get me in on a build crew? And he said, well, yeah, I could. But um, what I was thinking was whenever they finish, do you guys know Habitat, right? So Habitat basically helps people who can't afford a house get a house. And part of the way they do that is um, the people who are going to live in the house help build the house, right? Um, and so at the end of the house building, and, and there's a huge thing, like they go through, you know, credit checks and they go through background checks and, you know, make sure they're, you know, because they don't want to give it to a criminal or, you know. So they, it's a really huge undertaking to get this done. And at the end of it, they have a dedication ceremony where they dedicate the house. And my, my friend said, it would be really cool if they had a photographer to commemorate the house. And so I was wondering if you would consider doing that instead of building the house. And I'm like, okay, that I can do, right? So he makes a few calls, and I get to meet um, the Abu family. Aren't they just lovely? Look at that face, right? So Mr. Um, Abu and his two sons and his wife, who had just a week earlier given birth to twins. So she was there, the twins weren't, but um, God bless her. And uh, they were getting their house one beautiful day um, in the fall. Um, and so I went and I got them cutting the ribbon, right? And uh, yeah, you can see they're very happy. I love the little boy looking up at his dad, right? So he's very happy. Now, one thing I did not know about Habitat is Habitat is a Christian organization. Did you guys know that? I, right? I had no idea. They were a Christian organization. And one of the things that they always do at these dedications is they give the families a Bible so that they have a family Bible in their home. Um, but the Abus are Muslim, so they gave them a Quran. And it kind of felt for me like it was a nice pull. So I get very emotional. I, I, I was really cool taking this until I saw them give the Quran. I was like, oh my God, it's so great. <laughs> right? So I love that. So for me, this was kind of the the full circle, right? Like, all right, you know, I have faith in churches and, you know, I mean, I'm, I was raised in a church, but, you know, this was nice. This was nice. This is the kind of thing I know. Okay. So, I go back to my life, right? I'm not, I'm not an activist. I'm not doing this stuff. I don't do things. I, you know, things come up. I do them, but come on. Um, and uh, the book is released. And of course, as I'm writing this book, and my book is, it's called The Beauty of Different because the, the whole point, how am I doing on time? Somebody, I saw somebody look at a watch. Am I good? Okay. Um, so I, uh, I'm writing this book, and the premise of the book is, um, the book is called The Beauty of Different, and the tagline is Observations of a Confident Misfit. And my argument is, because I love photographing people, that, um, that everyone is beautiful. Um, and I realize it's not just a platitude. I, people who know me will, tell you that I believe this with everything that I am. And I think the world is a beautiful place, despite people like Terry Jones. And um, I think the world is a, is a lovely place. I think generally people want to be good. And I think everybody has a superpower. We may not know what it is, but I think everybody has something that lights them up. And if they just channel that, um, it's a superpower. There's no question. And so I'm, I'm writing this book, and, I, and the book features people who I think live their different in a beautiful way. Like they've identified what it is that makes them different, and they've sort of turned them into their superpowers. So I'm writing, and I'm photographing, and I'm really becoming quite passionate about this. And I'm giving talks on the book, um, and I'm giving talks about this, and I'm starting to really kind of, um, I remember telling a friend that I want to be a beauty expert, but not the way that most people think of that, right? Like I want to be the person that advocates and um, evangelizes about how beautiful we all are and are capable of being, right? And so I'm kind of getting my name out for that. And a friend of mine emails me um, one day, and she says, I think her name is Jill, and Jill emails me, and I think 
to the best of my recollection, the entire email, she's in social media, she said something like, hey, I think I have an opportunity for you. You came to mind. Um, I'm running out the door, so I don't have time to tell you much about it right now, but I just need to know, how do you feel about vaccinations, and how do you feel about ONE, the organization ONE, one .org, right? So I write back, I'm like, I have no problem with vaccinations. My, some of my best friends were vaccinated, I guess. Or, <laughs> right? And, um, and, uh, and I love one. Now, the truth is I had no idea who one was. Um, I, I vaguely had an idea of who they were. Um, and so for those of you who might vaguely understand who they are, do you know what Gap, the red, you know, the red, you know, they like in, you know, the red campaign, right? Like I knew, that's how I knew them. I was like, I knew one was affiliated with this red campaign that raises money for AIDS research, was kind of all I knew, all right? But of course I get this email, so I'm like, better look them up, right? So I'm, I'm doing some research, and one.org, they are a really amazing organization, and what they are, they were founded by Bono um, of U2 fame, and Bob Geldof, I believe, and maybe a couple others. And they are an advocacy group, they are not a charity, they don't raise any money, but they are an advocacy group that fights HIV and preventable diseases in emerging markets, particularly Africa, right? Um, because they're preventable. Malaria, tuberculosis, all of this other stuff. And what they do is they collect, they don't collect your money. They, their tagline is, we don't want your money, we want your voice. And so you sign up to become a member of one, and all those signatures, they go to primarily the US government, but also others saying, see, all these people care that people are dying in Africa. S please fund projects that will help them. Okay, advocacy group. You with me? Okay. So she emails me back and she goes, okay, I'm gonna introduce you to Lauren um, at one. And Lauren calls me and she goes, we wanna fly you up. We're doing this vaccination thing because we're trying to get kids vaccinated and stuff. Come up to Washington, DC. I'm like, great. They fly me to Washington, DC where they break the news that I'm gonna be going to Kenya. Yeah. Which you know, okay, right? Especially since like Visit Nairobi was on the life list, uh, Photograph the Maasai was on, like there was a lot of really, so I'm like, right on. So that was like May of this last year. Um, and so they say, we want you to come to Kenya with nine other bloggers um, to kind of talk about the work that one and the organizations they advocate for are doing, right? So I'm like, right on. And I'm the only photo blogger. Like everybody else is mostly a writer. I'm the only one that's going to be taking photographs except for their staff photographer. They have a staff photographer. So I'm like, great, I'm ready to go. Uh, but I've seen people go to um, emerging countries and I've been less than impressed with how they write about them. And I was really very nervous, right? I am from the Caribbean, I'm from an emerging country, so there's a part of me that feels like, like I wasn't really worried about seeing poverty. I mean, I'm, I'm from a country that's poor, so that wasn't a big deal. Um, but I was really worried about um, being the savior pity the poor people and thank God I'm here to tell their stories. You know, I mean, ugh. Like I was just like, I don't want to do it. But then how, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, particularly because I knew I was going to face some serious poverty. This is um, a photograph of Kibera, which is the largest slum in uh, Nairobi and the largest in Kenya. And they say the second largest in Africa and the third largest in the world. Um, th they don't really know how many people live here. They... Uh, Population run, estimates are somewhere between 300 and a million people. And the square footage is about Central Park that they're all living in there, right? So gives you an idea. Um, and so I was really worried that whatever I did, people would just sort of see poverty and go, and either pity the poor people, which I knew couldn't be all that Kenya had to be about, right? Um, or they would say, that is a hopeless case. Why would we even try, right? So I was really, really worried about that. And I'm like, okay, I've really got to figure out how I'm gonna go there and be sensitive to people. And also, I didn't wanna go there looking like I was going to the zoo, right? Like, you know, I'm like, oh, look, poor people, let me take a picture. You know, I mean, it could have been, it could, there were just so many ways this could have gone completely wrong, right? And I was really scared. I got on that plane, my husband will tell you, I was petrified. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm the right person to do this. I wanna make sure that I do this with sensitivity and with love. Um, and of course, uh, I got there and there was nothing to worry about. Um, so I'm gonna share some of the photographs um, that I 
I saw, uh, this is uh, a little school um, in another slum in, in Nairobi. Um, and this, is, this school has such a great story. Uh, so they're in a slum. And uh, no money, right? And uh, the schools, the, public, the government schools, as you can imagine, in a slum are really, really crappy. And the drug of choice in the slums is glue, sniffing glue. Okay, so a lot of the kids were go, you know, dropping out of school and sniffing glue, and you know, just not going a good way. And the parents of this slum decided that cannot stand, so they went to the church, and they said, "You guys have to do something." So they started the school, and so the teachers are generally just um, women and men in the community. Um, they are not certified teachers. They're not. They never went to college but they figure they can do a better job. And the kids are actually doing great and they're testing better than the government schools. Um, it was awesome, right? And so sort of the, the determination of this school was just mind blowing. And it was so great to be able to take photographs and, and tell that story of this determination. And they do this with a lot of help um, from organizations like CARE and that kind of thing, but they do it. And so they have to pay to go to school. They pay basically, I think like $5 a month right, for their kids to go to school there, and the kids are, are learning. And we got to watch a lesson um, and meet some of these amazing, beautiful kids, right? This little girl on the um, left, I was taking some photographs, and the girl on the left said, can you take a picture of me with my best friend? I'm like, absolutely, right? So um, unfortunately, I can't get it back to her. I don't know how to get a hold of her again, but I would love to give her that picture. Um, but anyway, so obviously, there's uh, incredible beauty here. Um, uh, isn't that a great face? I love her smile, yeah? This is an, uh, an actress. Um, the organization that she was working for um, is a, something called Carolina for Cabrera. And I'm gonna recommend this book for you. It's called It Happened on the Way to War, written by a, a former US Marine who started Carolina for Cabrera. Um, and uh, basically, it's sort of like a YMCA for kids who live in, in the slum. And uh, this was their 10th anniversary, and she was playing one of the people who helped with the um, founding of this thing. So she was, she's an actress. Uh, she actually, the, one of the people who founded it was a nurse, and she died of HIV, of AIDS. Um, and this gentleman over here is her son, and she was playing his mom at the time, right? So, uh, and then let me see what else. Uh, oh, another beautiful face, Rat. This guy's name is Rat. I, I didn't have the heart to tell him what that might mean um, here. Uh, Rat is a, um, Oh, what do, what do they call it? They called him a, a village, a village advocate, a village, oh, what was the name? Village reporter, village reporter. So what he does is, this is in rural Kabera, um, not Kabera, Kasumu, which is, for what it's worth, the small town on the other side of Kenya where um, President Obama's family is from. Um, and it is also ground zero for malaria, HIV, tuberculosis, basically any horrible disease. This is like, ground zero for it. And what they do is they go to the little homes um, in the village and visit women who have just given birth and make sure they're okay. Are you feeding the kids? Are you getting all the medicine you want? Do you need mosquito nets so you don't get malaria and all this other stuff? And Rat was very, he says he's like an uncle. Like he called himself an uncle. He goes to visit places. So we were visiting a home there. Um, and then this beautiful boy, uh, whose name I did not get, his family, um, uh, another sort of village reporter thing where they actually go from house to house in Kasumu and test people for HIV. Um, and so they know their status and they know how to, how to get help. He, happily, is negative. Um, his other members of his family weren't so lucky. But, um, but now they can get help, which was awesome. So it was really, as you can see, just crazy wonderful. Oh, and then uh, this next picture is one of my favorites. So, um, uh, so the village reporter program, uh, is run by this US CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and uh, KEMRI, which I think stands for the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Um, it's a joint program. Uh, the woman on the left is Dr. Kayla Laserson. She runs that program. And the woman on the right is uh, another village reporter who goes from house to house to make sure. And um, everywhere we went, we would get off the bus and they would sing. They would just break into song and dance. No idea what they were, and there was nothing to do but join, right? So we're all singing, and they're singing in like, like in harmony. Like it's not just like, you know, you and I would sing happy birthday and it all sounds off and, but no, 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 there's, there's basses and altos and everybody's singing. And so this was taken um, while we were all singing and dancing. They were dancing and uh, 
And uh, so basically, she, the woman on the right works for the woman on the left. So you can see um, a lot of love. A lot of love goes on there. So um, yeah, so it was sort of amazing. Um, and then this last one is me. <laughs> uh, the staff photographer for one took this picture photograph. This is my very favorite photograph taken of me in life. Um, remember the boy with the beautiful eyes? That's his little brother, and that's his mom. And so that was us doing a little terrorist fist bump <laughs> thing there. Um, there. So um, yeah, so that was a pretty amazing. So that was just this past July, right? I'm going back up uh, to Washington with one to see what's next uh, in a couple of weeks. So yeah, it turns out I'm an activist. <laughs> Who knew? Um, but it wasn't anything, like I said, it wasn't anything that I planned. Um, but the whole uh, process has taught me of a few things. And so I thought I would, um, on this very last slide, uh, just kind of uh, share with you some of the things I saw. This is Cabrera again, going into Cabrera. Um, so here's what I think. Um, I think that the first thing that you have to do, whether or not it's your company or you are a blogger, solo blogger, whatever, is if you want to do something, you need to make it in in integral to what you are, right? Um, case in point, there was a blogger actually uh, who went to, I don't want to lie, Pakistan, Nepal, I can't remember, a few months before this trip. Uh, and it was sort of a PR nightmare. And the reason uh, that it, ha it was that, it wasn't I don't think that uh, she didn't care, because I think she did, but her blog did not, it had nothing to do with her blog. She kind of got this really fabulous opportunity to leave, and so she came back and she threw a couple of photographs up, and it wasn't, clearly wasn't something that she was very passionate about. Um, whereas I think on, in my case, I've, I photograph faces, and I interview people, and I photograph travel, because I travel a lot. And so this was a very easy fit for me. The, the, um, the Kenya trip was a very easy fit for me. With the photo bomb, um, it, was, it's a, it, it works, because I'm a photographer, and I talk about photography and that kind of thing. And I think if you, if you do some sort of charity just because you feel like I did at the very beginning, where it's like, oh, I guess I should do something, um, people will be able to tell, unless you can really weave it into your own story. Um, and if you can weave it into your own story and, and make it to uh, do it in a way that, that is clear that it's what you're about, people love it, right? People respond to it, people enjoy it, right? So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I would say is also be creative. I, I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of being asked for money, right? I mean, I really am. I, I just, I, I'm sick of it. I, I, I'll do it, I'll give it if I need to, you know, if there's a big natural disaster, I always give it. But, Generally, if you're gonna ask me for money again, I'm probably I'm probably gonna ignore you unless there's some really personal reason why you know my family was affected by breast cancer. I have a cousin who has HIV. Like it's gonna have to be very personal. Um, but people love to be creative, right? And that was the p big lesson for me with um, Texas Children, right? People love sharing their photographs. People love it. And plus, because my audience loves photography. I knew they were out there. I knew there were people who loved to take photographs out there. And so if you can think of a way to be very creative with how to bring um, your message for good, I think people really respond to that very, very well. Uh, and, then, and the other thing I think um, also to remember is sometimes people don't know what's cool, right? Like sometimes, like the, the woman at, at Texas Children's, like she had no idea what I, what I was up to, right? Like it was like, why are you doing this? And it worked out to be really well. And I, it, it worked out really well. So I think if you are um, creative and you really kind of tap into your superpowers, tap into what you're really good at, tap into what your organization is really good at um, to try to help, a lot of times, even if people don't really get it, they'll get it, right? Because your passion and your love is, is in the action. You guys still with me? Yeah? Not nodding heads? Great. Okay. Um, Create community, definitely. I, I mean, that's the whole point of social media, right? That's the whole point. Like uh, uh, they said in the NASA talk right before us, right? It's about social media, right? The social is the really important part of this. Um, so allow other people to be creative for you. Um, one of the ways uh, that, that one was really brilliant, and this actually ties in with the next one about um, wherever possible reward people for their kindness. Um, we put signs, we had a bunch of, um, one had a bunch of other bloggers sort of be partners with 
the trip. And so they were basically tasked to help retweet anything we tweeted and blog about the trip and their thoughts about the trip. And so what we did, um, which was so easy, cost nothing, but it meant a lot, was we would take, we had a whiteboard with us. And so we would be like, hi, happy Katie from the Great Rift Valley, right? Or, um, and, and, and depending on what it was, like Katie loves cupcakes, so maybe we're in front of a Kenyan bakery and we would say that, you know, hi, happy Katie, having a cupcake in your name, right? Something that really kind of drew people in, right? Like, oh my gosh, they, they thought of us, right? They were thinking of us while we were there. And so I think rewarding people doesn't necessarily have to be expensive, right? Um, I've, one of the things I didn't tell you, so as a result of that trip, it was a week-long trip, uh, one ended up getting 13,000 more signatures as a result of that trip and got millions of tweet Twitter impressions because of it. It was a huge resounding success. Um, and so, and one of the ways that I helped get um, on, for just from my part, I thought, well, there were 10 of us there, three of us were authors. Um, why don't we, do, I'll just do a good book giveaway. Like if you sign up and leave a message that you signed up, a comment, I'll pick somebody at random to get our books and photographs from the trip, right? And so it's just a kind of a way that I can reward people. So any, it, there are ways that, that you can do it where it doesn't necessarily have to be expensive. I think, honestly, most people really just want to be acknowledged, right? And, um, and acknowledgement comes cheap, right? So how am I doing on time? Five minutes? Look at that. I'm right on time. So I'm ready to take questions. Here's what I'm going to do. I have two books. So the first two people who ask me a question, I'll give them a signed copy of the book, and then we'll just go from there, right? So good. Ah, we got one already. OK, so good. All right, um, so I'll take your questions. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, after I quit law and everything, was I ever nervous about the future? No, yeah, of course. <laughs> I was petrified. Um, yes, I was, yes. But um, I was also really, really miserable. And uh, like a, a lot of times people have said, oh, wow, you quit your job and without a plan. That's so brave. Uh, no, uh, it was brave for me to actually get up while I was sobbing every day going to work. Right? Like it was easier for me to quit. So yeah, it was, of course I was nervous. Um, there's had to be a lot of faith. But, but I had little signs. Like I had things like, you know, people, I'd, I had by that point developed a pretty good audience on my blog. So I kind of felt like, well, I guess I can write and I guess I can shoot because I've got this audience and I'm not really trying that hard, right? I've got a full-time job. So what would happen if I actually took my energy and tried, right? So I had a little bit of faith like that. Um, I, had a, I had and have a very supportive husband who was like, well, supportive or Jesus woman, please just do whatever it takes to be happy. <laughs> One of those two. Um, so that also helped. And I had a lot of, a lot of encouragement. So yeah, I was petrified. But, and actually, honestly, it's been three years. And, and I'm just now feeling like I've really got my footing, certainly as financially. Um, it, but I never, ever wanted to look back. I've never been happier, so for what that's worth. So thank you. What's your name? Kirsten. Thank you, Kirsten. Nice to meet you. <laughs> cool. Uh, who was next? I don't know who was next. Who was next? The, the woman in the black dress was next? Thank you. All right, and then I'll get to your questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Oh, not reluctant, accidental. Not reluctant. Not reluctant. Relu I'm rel yeah, not reluctant. I'm probably more going with the flow. I, and the reason I say that is because, um, because I don't want to do anything that doesn't feel authentic for me, right? Um, if there's a, you know, because every now and then somebody will call, you know, because now people kind of know, oh, she's been doing this, so we're going to do it. And every now and then somebody will email me and say, hey, could you write about or talk about this? And sometimes, like re most recently, a woman emailed me, and she was, uh, she, she's a huge advocate for postpartum depression. Right, a huge advocate about that, which is great. Except I've never given birth. I adopted my daughter. Right, so it's not anything that's like for me to all of a sudden start writing about. Oh, it, it doesn't feel organic, and that's not to say I don't support it. Like, I I, yeah, I agree. If you have postpartum depression, you should get help. But it's not something that I feel passion around. Um, but you know, like with one, I, I'm on the board of AIDS Foundation Houston here in Houston. Right, so like I had a lot of stuff. But you know, I I travel. I love travel. 
So it felt very organic, right? It was like, I, yes, I can definitely do this. So uh, in a lot of ways, I think I'm more going with the flow. If um, Right now, I've, I work with one a lot. I will continue to work with Habitat. Um, and if something else comes up that sort of calls to me, I'm certainly open to it. But I, I, I'm not going to take, and does that sound selfish? I don't mean it to sound selfish. But I, I want it to be so that people sort of respond, yeah? So tell me your name. Morgan, nice to meet you, Morgan. Thank you. Did you have a question, sir? Um, do we have time? You, we're good? Please? Two more? Two more questions. OK, yeah. Oh, my favorite photograph. Can I have my book back? Somebody, <laughs> I can show you, actually, my very favorite photograph I've, I've ever taken. Um, I love people. I love photographing people. That's my favorite, but it's not my favorite photograph. Uh, I have a really great one of Happy Katie, actually, in this, and her husband. OK, so this one on page 203 of a, of a dragonfly. Um, do you see that one? I, I love that photograph. I'm so proud. That, that one made me curse. <laughs> that one, actually, I was telling I was like, oh, I'm so flipping good. I was, I was, <laughs> that was one that I was really happy about. <laughs> huh? Why is it? Um, because the, I got so much detail in the, in the wings, and it looks almost like stained glass. Like, it reminds me sort of a church, almost. It's, I'm very, very pleased with that one. And, and it was, I took, just so you know, I took about 120 photographs of that thing to get that shot. So just uh, l let me just be real. Like it wasn't like I aimed the camera and went, oh, brilliant, and walked away. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead. Mm, have I had professional training? No, not at all. I, um, I bought the camera. A friend of mine who is a, um, a uh, fashion photographer, uh, I asked him to go with me to buy my camera. And so that old, ancient, Piece. And he, I remember he told me, he said, I, we're going to go by, oh, gosh, I'm out of the light. Hang on, I'm moving. I'm moving back in the light. I'm sorry. I'm back in your light. Sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, I, he said, okay, we're going to go buy a secondhand camera. We're going to go to Houston Camera Exchange, um, which is the best camera store, by the way. I'll give him a plug. Um, and uh, you're going to spend $500. This is 1994. You're going to spend $500, and you're going to buy a secondhand camera. And I thought he was high. I was like, oh, so you're smoking crack today? Um, <laughs> But he was adamant, and so I bought the camera and the lens for five hundred and one dollar, and um, and he took me out for two days, and we just shot around Houston, and that was it. So no, no, none at all. So any time for? Are we done? One more, two more, two more. Okay, somebody in the back had, somebody in the back, yeah, in the very back. Shooting people's fine. We're all friends here. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last one. What is it about shooting people? What? Oh, because I think people are beautiful. Um, uh, we were talking, I was talking to, is it Jeremy? Is that right? Jeremy, I was talking to Jeremy before this. Um, I think it was Jeremy. I think it was you, you I was talking to. Um, that there's something about the light in people's eyes. There's a moment, I take a lot of photographs. Anybody who's been photographed by me knows know, that I just talk. And I talk and talk and go click, 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 click. Um, there's a moment where people sort of stop posing, right? You know, like, uh -huh, and they got that, that smile, right? And then you say something funny, and then they relax, and you just see that light in their soul. Like, and that's beautiful, and it's universally beautiful. It's universal. People come up to me, and they go, oh, I hear you make people beautiful. I'm like, come on, it's a camera, not a magic wand. But, um, I mean, it, it is, but you are beautiful, right? I mean, everybody really is, is beautiful. And I love that moment where that falls apart, but that falls away. So, yeah, one more? No? Garrett. <laughs> oh. Wah, wah, Santra Bone. I'll hang out outside if that's okay, yeah? Thank you guys so much. Thank you.